Welcome to the worship services of Fellowship Community Church here in Centennial, Colorado. We're so glad you stopped by to worship with us in this way today. We want you to know, though, that we are open on Sundays. We've opened up uh, our building with all the safeguards in place, and we're inviting parents to bring their children. We're inviting all ages to come. And our children are given a special preview. If you go online to our website, you'll get a printout sheet for your kids in our worship. And you can get it online as well for your kids at home. If you're not yet comfortable to come to the church, we understand. And we're so thankful that we can come to you this way. We also offer our services in the parking lot on an AM, or excuse me, an FM uh, broadcast. So I hope that you'll enjoy the worship today. I want to open with a word of prayer. And I thank you for stopping by. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you that you have given us the opportunity to worship you. I thank you, Lord, that even in this season of pandemic, we are finding creative ways of how to gather together and worship you. So be honored and glorified in our worship today as we sing, as we pray, as we hear the word of God preached, and we give you all the praise and all the thanks. In Jesus' name. Yes. 
Thanks for joining us again this week as we continue our study of the miracles of Jesus. As we were preparing, as I was preparing for this series, uh, and we as a church body, we were thinking that we really need to know more of Jesus. And so I entitled the series, Simply Jesus. Jesus introduced his ministry in Luke chapter 4 when he went to his hometown of Nazareth. And while he was there in the synagogue and the scrolls were given to him, he read from Isaiah 61 these words, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then his sermon was very short. He just said, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus introduced in his ministry the year of the Lord's favor. And the word favor means the year of his welcome. And God is still in welcoming all of us into his presence. What a glorious day we are living in, in this age, this time, when all that is required to come to God is to come to God. And the moment we come to him humbly, he gives us everything we'll need for life here on the earth and in eternity. That's the message of the gospel. And what a blessed message it is. You might remember that Jesus' family and relatives and friends in Nazareth did not respond very well to his declaration. In fact, they tried to throw him off the cliff just outside of Nazareth. Well, as Luke continues to tell us the story of Jesus, he records for us teaching moments where Jesus is proclaiming the good news, and then demonstration moments of his power and his grace and his love and his mercy, particularly through his miracles. So in this series, we've been looking at some of the miracles of Jesus. We don't have time to look at all of them. Some of the miracles of Jesus, in fact, many of them, actually cause controversy with the religious leaders of Jesus' day. The story we're going to look at today is in Luke chapter 5, and this one is a very private scene, and so it did not cause controversy with the Pharisees. Let me read the text. I'm reading from Luke chapter 5 and verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. To introduce the story, I want to remind you that Luke does not give us these events in sequence. He is more concerned about themes. Matthew tells us that this event in sequence happened just after Jesus came down from the Sermon on the Mount. So they had just heard a long sermon and were impressed by his proclaiming the Word of God. In fact, they said he teaches with such authority. Different from all the rabbis, he didn't quote others. He just spoke, and it was the Word of God. And he spoke with authority. It's possible that this leper had heard the sermon. Uh, we're not sure about that, but it's possible. So that's the sequence order. And the text of Luke begins with the word behold. Behold, this man, this leper, saw Jesus and came to him. Now, he came to him privately. It wasn't a chance meeting. Obviously, it was on the divine calendar. And he came to Jesus. And he was covered with leprosy. Now, this is an instance where we see Dr. Luke giving us a very precise term to describe this man's condition. He was full of leprosy. We might conclude that he had had leprosy a long time, 
and that it was even in the final stages. So he's in a very desperate need. There's a quick sequence in the text. He saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground, and he begged him. All of this shows his great humility in Jesus' presence. As soon as he saw him, he fell with his face to the ground. By the way, in the preceding miracle, Peter fell at Jesus' feet in the boat when he saw the miraculous catch of fish and then responded and said, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Depart from me. So the leper and Peter both are respecting Jesus and and nearly worshiping him as as they do this. Um, He begged him. It's an urgent plea. It's a word Luke just loves to use. And the words that he spoke are very clear as well. Lord, he said, Lord, and I don't think it just means sir. It is a respectful term, but like Peter in the preceding story, when he said Lord, I think he is implying a lot more than just respect as a man. I think that he's noticing and recognizing Jesus as Messiah. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, this is a very simple condition. If A is true, you're willing, then B will be true, you can make me clean. And so he is very clear in his faith in Jesus, and it is a very humble faith. Jesus reaches out his hand to him, which is very startling because in the Old Testament, when they describe the miracle of the Exodus, it says God reached out for them. And it's a sign from Luke like a miracle is going to happen. He reaches out his hand. Mark adds that he was compassionate towards the man. Luke doesn't say that, but Mark adds that it was out of his pity and his compassion that he reached out and touched the leper. That becomes very significant. Because once he touched a leper, he himself would become unclean. And he did that in willingness. We might wonder how long it had been that this leper had even been touched. By another human being. He then, after he touched him, healed him with his words. It wasn't his touch. It was his word that healed the man. He says, I am willing. Be clean. The command suggests that this is not a process of healing. Sometimes Jesus did use a process. This is an immediate healing And the text confirms that. And immediately, the leprosy left him. And the implication is that he was fully healed, and it was permanent. Jesus' words then follow. He ordered him. Another word that Luke loves to use. It's a very strong word of um, command, a very direct command. Don't tell anyone. (laughs) And go... Show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Very interesting statement, and we might wonder why it is that he told the man not to say anything. Now, Mark adds that the man disobeyed, and then Luke tells us, along with Mark, that the news about him spread all the more, and he became more and more popular, and more and more people wanted to hear his teaching but also be healed of their sicknesses. The text concludes that Jesus, in contrast to all these crowds and popularity, often, has a pattern, withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Now that we've taken a little survey, I want to ask the question and try to answer it. What are the most significant facts in this story? Well, I think it's, first of all, very significant that this was a private meeting. Uh, Luke gave a signal, behold, this man came, and it is a very private encounter. The leper came to Jesus because he was desperate. The fact that he was covered in leprosy is a signal of that. The Old Testament uses this word in a variety of ways for a variety of skin diseases, and Leviticus chapter 13 and chapter 14 very, give very great detail of how to handle these things. Some think that the leprosy could have been something like psoriasis, but likely here, in this case, it is the most severe leprosy and one that could not be cured. In fact, in Luke 13, because they were afraid of it being so contagious, 
it is commanded in the law that a leper would have to go through an audience or a crowd saying, unclean, unclean, unclean. These people were put in isolation. They were quarantined. They were separated from their family, from their friends, and they couldn't do business, and they wouldn't be allowed to go into the temple or the synagogues. So this is a death sentence. To have leprosy was really a severe problem. The modern definition of leprosy that has been discovered over the years is Hansen Bacillus. And scientists discovered that it is caused by numbness in the digits, in the fingers, in the toes. And because of the numbness, the flesh is worn away and the person doesn't even realize it's happening. It is still incurable. I looked up statistics, and in 2017, there were over 200,000 new cases of leprosy on this planet. It's a very severe, severe situation. In some cases, leprosy was a sign of judgment. In Numbers chapter 12, Miriam opposes Moses because he married a Cushite, who would have been a black woman, and for that reason, God struck her with leprosy. So it was a sign of judgment there. The only other healing, she was healed, the only other healing is Naaman the Syrian. And if you remember from last week's sermon, when Jesus was in his home synagogue in Nazareth, he told the people about the story of Naaman being healed, though he was a Gentile. If you were a leper in that day, your only hope was a miracle. It was so rare that any leper would be healed. In fact, like I said, there's only two examples in the Old Testament. The cleansing would be required. It, it's not insignificant that he asked to be cleansed because he was so ostracized in every place. If you want healing in your life, if I want healing, I need to come to Jesus alone. I need to be one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. There, there's a place for me to just recognize that it's just my personal Savior and me. And whether it's by prayer or, or, or most likely, we come and we lay our requests before him. You might be desperate. These are desperate times. And I encourage you, run to Jesus. Believe that he exists. Believe that he is the Savior. And if you believe that, then practice coming to him alone in private and having those conversations. I admit that I have some secrets with Jesus that I just don't talk to anybody else about. And I give praise that my Savior is always faithful to listen and answer the needs that I express. Secondly, I think it's significant that the leper shows genuine faith. His need is for cleansing from leprosy, as we've already said. He requires a miracle. He is um, seeking a 100% miracle. He is not looking for a process of cleansing. He wouldn't know of any anyway, and in this case, he's looking for an immediate and complete healing miracle, which is what he receives. His faith is very humble. We, we notice that in the story because he saw Jesus, and he fell down on his face before him, almost an act of worship. And when he spoke, he doesn't doubt his capability. In fact, he affirms it. He says, if you're willing, I know you're capable to heal me and cleanse me. And that's so precious. I'm so impressed by his urgent request. He's very specific. Too many times, brothers and sisters, let's be honest, we come to Jesus in generalities, and we're afraid to be specific. And, and I would say, no, let us be specific in our requests to the Savior. Now, he still may say no or wait, and by faith, we will trust him anyway. And that's kind of what's implied by the man's statement. At least that's the way I read it. If you're willing, you're capable, and I'll be cleansed. And, and it feels like he is really demonstrating the kind of faith that Hebrews talks about. In Hebrews um, chapter 11, we read uh, the Bible's definition of faith. Now, faith is confidence in what we've hoped for. He was confident. 
in what he was hoping for, and the assurance about what we do not see. The word assurance has the implication of the title deed. It's like you own the place, you, you know that, and you have faith to believe that God is able to do what God intends to do. And you're going to trust him in it. Verse 6 in Hebrews 11, again, says something so profound. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And it feels like, to me, this man is just like that. His perspective is humble, but he's trusting. You might remember from Mark chapter 6, in the story of Nazareth in the Gospel of Mark, that those people did not believe. And it astounded Jesus. In Mark 6, 4, we read in Nazareth that Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. In contrast to the lack of faith in Nazareth, there was great faith of the people of this man, this leper, who came to Jesus. And I'm impressed by that. Many times we may struggle with not knowing what God's desire is. And, and we don't always know. Sometimes we have a verse of Scripture that we're standing on, and that's a good thing to do. But sometimes we just don't really know. But let us be bold in coming to the Lord and presenting our specific requests to Him. It seems to me that that is a good practice and one that we should exercise. If the answer we get is not what we expected, let us keep trusting in him. There's a modern song that says that so well. Even if the miracle doesn't come, I'm going to still trust in him. Thinking about that, I was reminded of three great men of faith. You may remember them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And this is in Daniel chapter 3. I choose to remember them by their Hebrew names. Hananiah, which means the Lord is gracious. Mishael, which means who is the Lord who is God? Who is he that is God? And Azariah, the Lord has helped. Now, you might remember that they got into some trouble because they wouldn't bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's uh, idol. And before they were thrown into the fire... This is what they said. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, and that's what I love about their faith, even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. What a picture of faith. And it seems to me that the leper had a similar kind of faith. The third fact that I notice in the story is that Jesus heals him solely by his word. The steps of the healing are very compassionate, very tender. He reached out to him, as we said. He touched him. You know, it had been a long time, perhaps, since this leper was touched. Now, by the way, um, Jesus broke the law by doing that. Uh, you're not supposed to touch a leper. A leper's not supposed to ask to be touched. And the moment that Jesus touched the leper, he became unclean like the leper was. But Jesus touched him anyway. And then he healed him, he expressed his willingness to heal him, and then he commanded, be clean. And the command was effective. If Jesus pronounces you clean, you're clean. And this man was clean forever. The departure of the leprosy is indicated as a once-for-all act, not to be repeated. He was clean. And it was complete and immediate. I think of the man in John, and I don't know that it's the same man, but there's this story of uh, Jesus was in the house of Simon the leper. Well, I actually think John should have written Simon, who used to be a leper, <laughs> he's not a leper anymore. And that's the story, a similar story right here. Now, Jesus then sends him to the priest. Why did he tell him not to speak? I'm not sure, but I think his growing popularity was becoming a hindrance. 
And so he told him not to speak. In fact, the text says it very quick succession. He gives him four commands. Don't tell, go away, show yourself to the priest, and offer the sacrifices. This is an acknowledgement that he was cleansed and that he is to go through the Old Testament requirements of declaring his cleansing, of being able to re-enter society and to be cleansed to go into the temple and be restored um, ceremonially so that he can be active in worship. Leviticus 14 gives us some specifics about what that would look like. Now, I kind of chuckled when I looked at this because Jesus says this is going to be a testimony to the priest. In the lifetime of this priest, I don't think they ever saw a leper come in to be cleansed. I mean, I just don't think it ever happened because this was such a death sentence. But if perchance one was cleansed of leprosy, they were required to be examined by the priest. The examination, according to Leviticus 14, would happen outside of the camp. So they would look over the skin of uh, the leper and it would be examined outside. And then outside of the camp, they would sacrifice one bird for cleansing and let a second bird, a clean bird, go free. And it's kind of a picture of the fact that this man's life was restored. By blood, he was cleansed, and now he was set free. Subsequent to that, he had to be washed in water and be cleansed of his clothing. Then he would shave off all the hair in his body and then begin to make sacrifices to God. And the sacrifices required, get this, were all four sacrifices in the Old Testament. There's a sin offering, there's a guilt offering, there is the burnt offering, and then a grain offering, as well as oil poured on. Jesus Christ fulfilled all the sacrifices. But the testimony of restoring a leper was precise, and it was complete. And this is why I think Jesus told him to go as a testimony to them. Healing lepers was a sign that Jesus is the Messiah. The miracle of healing lepers was a great sign of his power and his love and his compassion. And Jesus did it solely by his word. It did not tax him. It was not hard for him to cleanse a leper, even though no one else could do it. And maybe that's just the point. At the end of the text, it's almost a footnote, we see that Jesus withdrew often as a pattern to pray in lonely places. I find that remarkable. First of all, remarkable because he didn't stay with the popular crowds. He took time alone with the Father. He prayed alone. And, and I say to myself, it kind of rebukes me, <laughs> How much do I spend time alone with the Lord? How much time do you spend alone with the, with the Lord? The scripture says that we will be renewed day by day as we spend time with the Lord, that his glory will be revealed in us as we spend time with the Lord. And it seems like at this season, we especially need to remember the example of Jesus. I could say it this way. If Jesus needed to spend time alone in prayer with God, the Father, how much more do we? And may we learn from that example. This isn't the only place that Luke tells us this. In fact, back in chapter 4, he said the same thing about Jesus' pattern of praying alone. I want to finally close with giving you this image. What happened to this leper can happen in your life and mine. It really is a beautiful picture of the salvation experience that God offers us in this season of favor when he welcomes sinners to come to him. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, we read, God made him who had no sin, who had never sinned, to be sin for us, in our place, for our sake, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When Jesus met this leper who came to him honestly confessing his need, when we recognize our sin and we recognize how desperately we need the miracle of salvation and forgiveness, we will come to Jesus alone. And we will come 
urgently asking him for cleansing. Jesus is willing to touch us as sinners. God made him who knew no sin become sin for us. He became our substitute. He died in our place to pay the whole debt for our sin. He died for the forgiveness of our sins. He died to give us forgiveness, and it's complete and full. It doesn't come in a process. It comes in a package, once for all delivered, and forever valuable, and forever in place. When Jesus, when we by faith trust in him, he says, you're clean. You're righteous. And when God looks at us, even though we're sinners and still sinning from time to time as believers, he still sees the righteousness of his son. That's a picture of salvation. I want to ask you, have you come to Jesus alone, recognizing and confessing your personal sin debt to God? Have you come desperate knowing that you need a Savior? For some, this is a very dramatic encounter for others, not so dramatic, but real. If you are convicted of your sin, because you do not believe on Jesus, and you're convicted that he's the only righteous one that ever walked on the earth, and that judgment will come to those who do not trust in him, then I urge you, I call you today, put your trust in Jesus. Simply, ABC, acknowledge your sin before him, confess your faith, believe on him, and then tell others of what you've experienced. Just as Jesus sent him to the priest to confirm his cleansing, you can tell others. When you really come to faith in Christ, you don't have to be told to tell others because you're so excited and thankful for the forgiveness, you want to share it with others. I thank you for joining us today. I'd like to close in a word of prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this story. It's such a wonderful miracle that you performed for this leper. We thank you, Lord, that you are cleansing sinners all the time, every day, people are coming to faith in you and experiencing the miracle of the new birth. So I ask you, Lord, in Jesus' name, to take these words and apply them to those who are listening today. Help them, if they've never trusted you, to know that you are willing to forgive them. You are more than willing to do it, and you accomplished it in full by dying on the cross for us. And all we need to do is believe on you. So thank you, Lord, for these great words we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings come.
Thank you for joining us today in worship. We really enjoyed looking into the story of the cleansing of the leper in Luke chapter 5. And a final reminder, it is a picture of how you can come to faith in Jesus Christ. It may seem very simple, and it is. Naaman didn't especially appreciate the simplicity of what the prophet told him to be cleansed. All you need to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. May God in his grace help you and draw you today to put your trust in him. And for all of us who have trusted him and are following him, we say hallelujah and praise our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.